Welcome to the first lecture on pulmonary function test interpretation. My name is Gilbert Burdine. I have been reading PFTs since 1980 in both academia and private practice. During 20 years in private practice, I have interpreted pulmonary function tests on a daily basis in conjunction with the clinical evaluation of patients. The target audience for these lectures is anyone interested in interpreting PFTs. Although a person familiar with the concepts presented in John West's textbook on pulmonary physiology will get the most out of these lectures, a technician can use the material presented in these videos as a cookbook to interpret PFTs. We will start with a normal subject. The material presented is an actual PFT performed on a patient at University Medical Center in Lubbock, Texas. One cannot appreciate the disease states without first understanding what a normal study looks like. This is an actual PFT report. The layout will depend on the equipment used and the software settings, but the material will be similar on all modern equipment. Following a brief overview of the entire report, I will explain each part of the study in greater detail. I always start with the flow volume loop. This is a graphical representation of the spirometry maneuver. The other graphical form for this information is the volume versus time spirogram. Medicare requires either a flow volume loop or a spirogram to be included with the report. The reimbursement is slightly higher for a flow volume loop than a spirogram, so all modern equipment displays the loop. After describing the flow volume loop, I move to the spirometry. These numbers are derived from data during the expiratory limb of the flow volume loop. Next are lung volumes. These numbers are derived from pressure measurements taken from a mouthpiece and body box. The procedure is called body plethysmography. An alternative method used by less expensive equipment derives lung volumes from helium dilution. Last are the diffusion measurements. These numbers are derived from measurements of carbon monoxide. A normal flow volume loop looks like a child's drawing of a sailboat. Flow is displayed on the vertical axis. Volume is displayed on the horizontal axis. The origin is a start of an expiratory maneuver from maximal inspiration or total lung capacity. Note that positive movement along the volume axis represents a decrease in lung volume. This is due to the historic methodology of a bell spirometer which would rise during exhalation. The black trace shows the computer projection of a normal exhalation. The expiratory limb of the maneuver is a triangular sail above the waterline. The inspiratory limb of the maneuver is the rounded hull below the waterline. The peak in expiratory flow is very early in the exhalation. This creates the triangular appearance in the expiratory limb. A good effort will have a sharp peak. Submaximal efforts will have a blunted peak. The descent of the expiratory limb is nearly linear. This shape and deviations from it will become important when we discuss obstruction and restriction. The inspiratory limb creates the rounded hull. The peak in inspiratory flow is at mid-inspiration. A well-performed maneuver without leaks should close the loop. The spirometry values should confirm what we see in the flow volume loop. The first order of business is to determine whether or not a ventilatory impairment is present. The FVC, or forest vital capacity, should be greater than 80% of predicted for the sex, age, and height. Some systems make minor corrections in predicted values for race. Values less than 80% represent a ventilatory impairment. Values above normal have no functional significance. The FEV1, or forced expiratory volume in one second, should also be greater than 80% of predicted. The F25-75 
is also called the mid-flow. It is the average flow between 25% of exhalation and 75% of exhalation. A normal mid-flow should also be greater than 80% of predicted. If all the other values are normal and the mid-flow is less than 80%, this pattern represents small airways disease and is seen in cigarette smokers as a precursor to COPD. This finding can be used as a warning to patients about the importance of smoking cessation. The peak flow percentage should be as good as the lesser of the FVC and FEV1. A low reading for peak flow could be due to neuromuscular weakness, central airway obstruction, such as a tracheal stenosis, or a submaximal effort. The FEV1 to FVC ratio determines whether airflow obstruction is present. Low values of FEV1 to FVC should be seen when the flow volume loop is scooped. This will be covered during the next lecture. Airflow obstruction implies that the FEV1 is reduced out of proportion to the FVC. Normal values for FEV1 to FVC ratio decline with age. I have used a lower limit of normal of 0.75 up to age 65 and it has worked well for me. Studies on COPD use an inclusion criteria of FEV1 to FVC less than 0.70 regardless of age. Lung volumes must be interpreted within the context of ventilatory capacity. If there is no ventilatory defect, the lung volumes do not matter. The lower limit of normal for total lung capacity is 80% of predicted. If there is a ventilatory impairment, then a TLC below 80% defines a restrictive ventilatory defect. If there is a ventilatory defect, then a TLC greater than 120% suggests hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is often seen with airflow obstruction. Like TLC, the normal limits for residual volume are 80% to 120% of predicted. As mentioned above, high values for TLC and RV are only significant if there is a ventilatory limitation. In COPD, the pattern of hyperinflation is usually, usually residual volume increases out of proportion to total lung capacity. This produces an elevation of the RV to TLC ratio, which can be used to detect air trapping. The lung volume measurements are inherently less accurate than spirometry. Lung volumes must be interpreted within the context provided by spirometry. Like the lung volumes, it is important to interpret diffusion within the context of spirometry. Once again, the lower limit of normal is 80% of predicted. The diffusion measurements have a greater standard deviation than the other measurements, so a slightly low diffusion, say 75%, with all other measurements normal would like be, likely be a normal variant. The diffusion measurement can be falsely depressed due to active cigarette smoking. A low diffusion value with normal lung volumes and spirometry can be a sign of pulmonary vascular disease. Pulmonary hypertension should be considered in this situation. The correction, for alveolar, the correction of diffusion for alveolar volume is often misinterpreted. A low DL that corrects to 100% DL to VA ratio is not normal. The DL to VA ratio can give information about the nature of the diffusion impairment. If entire VQ units are destroyed together, such as in lung resection, a low DL will correct to a normal DL to VA ratio. In emphysema, however, capillaries are destroyed without loss of airspace, which leads to a low DL that does not correct. I have not found this distinction to be very helpful in clinical management. That concludes the discussion of the normal PFT. The next lecture will cover the PFT in airflow obstruction.